Hello and welcome back to the Five Factors Podcast. I am Tal Prince here along with the inimitable Matt Adair. Uh, Big words. Gentlemen. Yeah, big words. We're trying to break them all out. And uh, so why not? So here we are. Um, hopefully you've heard episode one and got an overview uh, of the podcast in general and who we are and what we're planning to do. But we're going to walk through that again, just in case you didn't. Uh, but Matt, uh, welcome. Uh, it's good to see you again. Good to see you too, my friend. I will agree with you. Uh, it's always good to see me. So um, this is the deal. We're going to talk today. Um, uh, it's going to uh, be uh, one of those days. I feel it. I feel it coming. You know, I'm, you know so this is just, you know, be forewarned. Uh, <laughs> it, it could go just like this. So we may be re-recording. Who knows? <laughs> but, 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 but whatever does get recorded is what you're hearing on the podcast. So, you know, we won't tell you how many takes it took because we just ended up in a puddle of laughter. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, we're we're this may or may not be take 23 so um but let's let's uh let's let's start softly and smoothly um you know our, uh, so we, we talked a little bit um earlier um just about you know it, right now kids are starting back to school uh yours are starting back to school uh what and I know you have an interesting story, so I'm not going to go, hey, do you have an interesting story? Um, yeah. So uh, tell, tell our listeners the story you told me uh, as your kids are starting back to school. Yeah, so uh, my oldest uh, is in seventh grade, and um, in the first couple of days of school, I uh, came home pretty upset, and um, he is on the autism spectrum, and, um, and so when your kid comes home upset on the spectrum, you're not quite sure uh, what's going on. And, and so the first uh, day was so, so he is in a new set of classes mm -hmm. and the first day he came home and was upset because he wasn't in there with his friends from last year. Um, the second day he came upset because they had changed, uh, certain things that he liked about school. Uh, and so, I mean, it was wailing and gnashing of teeth. It was a full on meltdown. <laughs> it was my wife in the car on the way home in the driveway, trying to get him settled down. He came in, he'd go about the rest of his day and he'd just have these episodes where he'd just start sobbing. And, uh, so obviously, you know, we, we hate that for him, but we were also going, okay, so, uh, buddy, like, I mean, you, you were changing classes last year. Why is this such a big deal this year? And so then... Um, at the end of the second night of school, he uh, pulls my wife into his room and lets her know uh, it wasn't just friends that he was hoping to see. It, it happened to be two particular girls. Now, what I love about my my son is the uh, the, the the confidence, the bravado, the machismo that he yes. has. Um, so, at the end of last year, uh, there was uh, an event that I helped chaperone. Um, and so, uh, my son is not necessarily socially aware part of his thing in being on the spectrum, but mm -hmm. throughout the night when we were at this event, uh, different girls kept coming up and talking to him and he would just kind of ignore them. Not because he was trying to play it cool, but because he doesn't know any better. And, uh, so we're in the car and I'm, I'm telling him, Hey man, um, so, uh, looks like you had a good time with your friends. Yeah, I did. Saw a couple of girls come up and talk to you. He's like, yeah, he said, dad, I mean, it's, it's really a hard thing. Like every single girl in sixth grade has a crush on me. <laughs> <laughs> so what I believe that we are experiencing uh, here in seventh grade is the fruit of that. And so uh, he is heartbroken. And so uh, really what it gets into and how it relates to this conversation um, is that as we think about uh, leadership and we think about leadership, not just in our jobs, but even in our homes, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's having to, to take that on some level. I'm like, I'm really happy that that's the challenge because it isn't that he's being bullied or something like that. It's just right. his heart's broken. But hear what I just said, just that his heart's broken. Like, I mean, mm. uh, in some ways it's crazy for him to be feeling what he's feeling. Um, and it's completely upside down and, and, and crazy. But, um, I went through that stage of life and, uh, and I know what that is. And so the ability to be able to be empathetic and, uh, and so my wife and I have just had good conversations about we handle that this year. But again, it mm -hmm. just gets back to that. Not only the emotional intelligence that I hope we're able to uh, use in serving our son, uh, but also the relational presence of just being there with him and uh, not trying to fix it, not trying to solve his problems, but just being there with him and knowing mm -hmm. that, uh, that he's loved and cared for. That's that, that last part is so huge that you're not, you're not there just to, to fix it, but just to be there 
Uh, to be present relationally, to be present, uh, fully present mentally, physically, emotionally, you know, for him, you know, which is, um, I mean, that's a challenge for a lot of us, but particularly um, it's its own unique challenge when you're dealing with a child on the spectrum, Um, you know, that just is not um, as it just it has challenges in that arena to be fully present, um, you know, and, just, and to connect emotionally is a, uh, is a challenge. And so, man, kudos to you for fighting through that and, uh, and to find out that he, like his dad. This isn't going to end well, wherever you um, end so, it. Yeah. <laughs> just, I mean, you said you could identify because you went through that. And yeah, I, I could, but when we start talking about my middle school career, I'm probably going to end up in a puddle of tears. Yeah, I mean, some of us, you know, were attracted to the opposite sex and some of us were attracted at a more professional level, uh, we'll say. Um, And uh, we'll end it there. So let's talk about the, uh, you know, the five factors, uh, you know. It it, It is the name of the podcast. It is the name of the podcast. Those five factors very quickly uh, are resilience, strength, presence, hope, and ambition. Um, and, And so if you would like to, Matt, why don't you, because you're the system guy um why don't you uh take our listeners through just a quick walkthrough uh of those five factors yeah in general when we talk about the five factors we're talking about an approach to leadership we're talking about a framework for you to think about um what it looks like to lead and we believe that uh, healthy leaders which is what we're after and that we want to be and what we hope to develop um and others including you as you're listening to this podcast um are men and women who are resilient, who are strong physically, who uh, do know how to be relationally present, who are ambitious and uh, who have hope in the work that God is doing in them and through them. So really what we're talking about here in terms of the five factors, we're talking about those outcomes based on five different areas of health, mental health, physical health, relational health, spiritual health, and vocational Mm -hmm. health. All those work together to make us into the people that we are, into the leaders that we want to be. Mm Mm-hmm. And and how would you say that what we're doing, I mean, I have my ideas, but how would you say what we're doing is different uh, than what is um, always already available in the leadership landscape today? Well, it's a good question for a couple of reasons. One is because what you're not going to hear us say is, hey, come be a better leader. Um, and there's some real practical reasons for us why we don't do that. Number one is that most, uh, if, if we say, Hey, come be a better leader, it's going to force you as a leader to decide that you're not a very good leader. And Mm -hmm. I don't know if you are or not. Um, I just know that most people don't like to do that kind of self assessment. (laughs) And what I also know is that, uh, from, and I don't care what field you're in, in the, in the realm of self-improvement, most people aren't willing to do the work to get there. So we would be foolish to sit here and go, Hey, come be a better leader. Um, But I think there are other reasons for this, including the fact that in the end, we're talking about a different way of thinking about leadership. Um, What we see um, are a lot of pieces and parts as it comes to to leadership. We're watching a lot of people grab onto one part of what we think it takes to be a healthy leader and think that that's everything that uh, that, that, that it means to be a leader. Mm-hmm. And so uh, even when we talk about sort of the foundation of this with spiritual leadership, because we're coming from a Christian perspective and we're working with a lot of church leaders and ministry leaders, uh, if spiritual leadership is the foundation, there are times in which we can start to sound like dualists and we mm-hmm. don't actually care about our bodies and our minds. And we think that those things matter. And so what we're doing differently is creating an entire picture of what it takes for you and I as leaders to show up day in and day out to do the work that God's called us to do in such a way that we're able to stick in there and make it for the the long haul. I have, um, I have plenty of friends um, and have seen a lot of people over the years that have started off strong uh, and haven't made it. They either decided to take themselves out of the game or Mm -hmm. they got taken out of the game. And so I don't want that to happen to you. And so that's the difference that we're trying to make. We're focusing on health. We're focusing on the long run and we're going to talk about being micro aggressive and macro patient. We want you to really lean in and take the long approach to what it means to develop your health, but we want you to show up uh, day in and day out as a leader and do the work that you need to do. Yeah, we talk about in what I do uh, as a as a therapist, we talk about, you know, proximate change. Uh, so we're not talking about, uh, let's say, for example, I've got a client who, you know, has anxiety. <clears throat> this happens from time to time. 
So, uh, you know, here's a, you know, here's a, here's a leader and he comes to me and he's got anxiety about, let's say flying. Uh, he's scared to death. He doesn't want to do it. He's, he's on a plane. He's freaking out. Um, and so I would ask him, okay, so as you think about getting on an airplane on a scale of one to 10, where's your anxiety from one meaning I'm ready to take a nap to 10, meaning I'm going to open the exit door and jump out of this thing, whether we're on the ground or 35,000 feet, I don't care. I need it out. Um, they're going to give me a rating, right? So let's say they say seven. All right. I'm not going to try and take them from a seven to a one. Yeah. I want to get them from a seven to a six and a half. Yep. Okay. So what do you need to move from a seven to a six and a half? What do you need for that? That's easier to think about than trying to think about removing the anxiety completely. Yeah. Um, and so we're just trying to stair step and do increments and do that together. And that's really uh, what I'm excited about, about the five factors is, is we're helping people make incremental long-term change, but it's not about trying to, oh, well, you know, so you don't have emotional intelligence. Well, let's fix that today. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's incremental change. And I think that's really, uh, you know, a nice move into what our topic for today is because the factor we're focusing on in this podcast is an area of your, um, you know, what strength I, one might say, uh, because that's the factor we're going to talk about is, is, is strength. So, uh, how do you think about frame up strength? Uh, and as you look at the ministry landscape, the leadership landscape today, where are people missing it in terms of strength? Well, first off, I think a little bit of background for me in terms of my own story. So um, I grew up as the um, uh, air quote husky kid. Um, and, uh, and so I, I started high school, I was uh, about five foot three and weighed almost 200 pounds. Now, uh, I'm 41 at the time that we're recording this. I now am about five foot 11 and weigh about 180 pounds. Uh, for those of you listening uh, in countries that follow the metric system, I don't know how many kilograms that is. Um, <laughs> but, how many stones do you weigh? <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> if feel free to send that in to us, uh, y'all, and let us know that. Um, and, and so uh, for me, I would watch. I can remember. Uh, I can remember when Rocky IV was released. Least. and nice. the uh, training montage when he's in Russia. And I can remember being drawn to that, you know, picture of strength. And, um, and, and that was kind of the world that I was around because uh, as we established in episode one, and as we will further in, in, in episodes to come, I grew up loving pro wrestling. And so, um, you know, I would have guys that I would look at and say, you know, when I grow up, I would love to look like that. Well, again, I'm five foot 11, 180. So that didn't actually happen. So there was some genetic predisposition to how I was going to turn out. Uh, but I think that uh, for me, the reason that became so important um, what was, was a little bit because of my own uh, vanity, my own identity issues mm. that, that do play into part of this. But what I found over time is that um, I eventually became a personal trainer. I've lived in this world. I still spend a lot of time in this world mm -hmm. thinking through the importance of physical health. And, and what I found is in the end, it's critical because God cares about our bodies. God created us to live for the long haul. And, and what we're finding with leaders is that leaders are sabotaging themselves mm. because they're paying attention to almost everything else except for their physical health. Mm. Yeah. I, I, and you and I have had remarkably opposite journeys. Um, <laughs> I started school um, at, I, I, when I started high school, uh, we moved from Memphis, Tennessee to Portland, Oregon. That for those of you who are not aware is a radical shock of culture. Yeah. Um, it's like two different universes. Holy crap. I, I was going to an all boys prep school, um, you know, where jeans were not allowed. It was khaki pants and IZOD shirts and um, Sperry topsiders was the uniform of the day. Uh, moved to Portland, Oregon, uh, where it was bell bottom jeans and velour shirts. Um, that's nuts. Um, so I had yeah, to, I said I was 41. I'll let you do the translation on how old Tal is. Yeah. Yeah, 52 kids. Let me save you the math. So I don't want any calculator smoking or if you're using an abacus, uh, you know, who knows? So, uh, but I, so I started school, uh, you know, in Portland, Oregon at 4'11", 90 pounds. 
Um, and, and so now I'm six foot and now I'm at 200. So uh, you and I have had opposite journeys. And yeah. so I'm somebody who needs to hear uh, from you, as, you know, about these issues. And it's something that I need to be focusing on. So uh, I, I think as we approach that as somebody who needs to, there's, there's all kinds of information out there. There's all kind of common myths out there as to, well, you need to do this. You need to focus on this. And it's, you know, and oh, it's gluten. And oh, it's, you know, it's, 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 an, it's a no carb diet. It's all these different things um, that are out there. What are some of the common myths? Because I know you've worked through this that you see uh, as it pertains to physical health. Well, the two that I think are really critical are that we make it overcomplicated, that in the end, physical health is the sort of the combination of how we eat, sleep, and move, mm -hmm. um, that um, all those things play into uh, our physical health. What we eat matters. Um, what we do in terms of exercise and movement is really critical. And then the one that's kind of become a little bit of a, a hot topic and a little bit of a trend, I see this a lot in broader leadership circles is sleep and the importance of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was slow on that one. So I was the guy who mm -hmm. dialed in nutrition and exercise in some real ways when I was, you know, 19, 20 years old, but it probably hasn't been to the last four or five years that I started really dialing it in on, on sleep. And mm -hmm. so if you're trying to think like, what does it take for me to be physically healthy what you know if I'm gonna be strong um, uh, so I can do the work of leadership then it's just it right. really comes down to the simplicity of eat sleep and move now here's the second part of that that I think is critical and a common myth is that um, what I see most people doing is taking off-the-shelf eating sleeping exercise plans and thinking that there is a perfect plan out there so mm. you've got everybody and man I have lived through the uh, uh, the low fat phase. Um, matter of fact, at one point when I was in college and I was training a lot, um, I, I, I mean, it was right in the middle of that where everything was low fat. And so mm -hmm. uh, I was training so hard that I got down to about 155 pounds. And I look back on those uh, pictures now and I look like a skeleton. And, and it wasn't until uh, there was a trainer at the gym that I was going to and said, hey man, I see you're in here every day. You're working hard what are you doing in terms of nutrition? I told him and that's when he just started to smarten me up in terms of, Hey, we need to think of this a little bit different. Um, but you see it now. So now it's, you know, is it a uh, high fat keto diets? Uh, is it gluten free? Like what is there out there? Uh, mm -hmm. right now there's a big, uh, kind of a craze about your macros. You know, if you just, it doesn't matter what you eat, as long as you have the right percentage of fat, carb and protein, right? Same thing with exercise. CrossFit is the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, running is the way to go. Uh, yoga is the way to go. And so here's what I found. And this is the second thing that's critical. If all you need to do is pay attention to eating and sleeping and moving, the only perfect plan for you is the one that works for you. Mm -hmm. And so what I find is an unwillingness to play the long game and to really investigate and, and kind of test out what works for us. And I totally get it because we want to make progress now and we don't like the pain of having to wait on some of these things, but there is no other solution. The only way that you're going to be able to move forward on this is being able to focus on just a handful of things and finding what works for you and then uh, letting that be okay. So I have clients that I work with that their exercise regimen, their diet, their sleep plan, they look radically different from one another, but they work for them because they work for them. Mm. So eat, sleep, and move. It's, yeah. it's, it's really, I mean, that breaks it down into very simple bite-sized pieces for a guy like me who's, yeah. you know, I mean, like you said, I mean, good grief. I mean, if you're, if you're paying any attention at all, I mean, to culture, it's, you know, I think it's about gluten or it's paleo or it's, you know, and, and, and then you get around it. If you start to investigate it, you know, uh, as, as a guy like me, you start to investigate, okay, what's this about? Well, then people start using words. You have no idea what they mean. Um, <laughs> gets, and then that's, that's demotivating. And so I'm like, ah, screw this. I don't want anything to do with yeah. it. Um, that's way too complicated. But if we break it down to eat, sleep and move. Yeah. You know, those are, th those are pieces that we can use, uh, you know, and move forward. Uh, as you look at physical health and strength, would you say that there is a secret to any of that? Well, I think the secret is this, uh, in terms of the way that this works together. Um, you know, and so if, if people are listening and going, okay, that sounds great, but, but what, what are the benchmarks? And I would say the foundation for each of those areas is, um, you want to eat, uh, you want to consume fewer calories than you're burning. 
right? Um, you want to sleep seven to nine hours a night. And anybody who does any kind of research work in sleep is going to say, if you are an adult, that's, you need seven to nine hours of, of, of sleep a night. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of movement, we're all over the map on that. Uh, but at the very least, it's finding uh, ways three, four, five times a week to at least get out there and moving around. Um, that um, that it's it's important for that to happen. But if I was to say the secret to physical health is this: the reason what's happening with all three of those areas is is the secret to physical health is hormonal balance. So mm -hmm. your body is made up of a series of four, uh, primarily four different kinds of hormones: fat burning hormones hunger hormones, stress hormones, reproductive hormones. And those are all messengers. There's not just like four of them. There's like thousands of these messengers working. And what happens when we dial in on our eating and our sleeping and our moving is that we basically keep those messengers from creating a pile up, which gets us all stressed out. We're not mm -hmm. burning fat. We're gaining fat. Uh, and we're hungry all the time. And why is that? It's because of our hormones, but the way in which our hormones get organized, the way in which they operate in, in a way that's fluid and helps us uh, to be physically healthy and strong uh, is by that combination of eating, sleeping, and moving. So if you really want to figure it out, the secret to physical health is hormonal balance. And, you know, you said something, well, you said a lot of things that were very helpful in that. And, and I, I, I'm a neuroscience guy. So you start talking about, you know, hormones and messengers uh, and, and the ability to reprogram them. It, it's really yeah. easy to get into the defeatist mindset of, well, this is, this is just what it is. I, you know, I don't, I, it's just what it's the way my body is wired. Um, no, there's so much you can do. Uh, the brain is what we like to call plastic, meaning it's very moldable. It is, it is changeable. There's not a pattern of thinking that is locked in. You know, there's a lot we can do to help change that. Uh, and so we can, we can give those messengers better messages to send. We can retrain those messengers to when and where they go. Uh, but one of the bigger challenges that I see out in, you know, out in the United States anyway, is how does somebody go about honestly um, consuming fewer calories uh, than they're burning every day? What's one of the major things you do there? With some sanity it's actually uh, paying attention and counting them. And the reason I say with sanity is because you can become obsessed with, you know, uh, the, the difference between, you know, one almond and two almonds that you eat. Mm. Um, I do think that paying attention to macros, how much fat, how much protein, how much carbohydrates mm -hmm. I'm consuming, um, and being able to just measure that is helpful. So, uh, I mean, as I've started to do that, it's been very helpful because what I know is that um, I am usually – uh, very, very generous in the way that I think about the calories that I'm consuming, meaning that you give me that entire extra large pizza and I'm going to tell you that it basically has a hundred calories. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, I need some reality that's built in, particularly when I'm eating under stress, right? What about Which a slab where, of ribs? Yeah. Um, you know, that's uh, that's calorie free, isn't it? <laughs> and so, um, that, that's what happens to us. And so we don't, uh, we, we actually don't do a good job in computing in the same way that some of us uh, have thought in times past, maybe in present, and so if you're doing this, quit doing this, is we keep up with our bank balance in our head. Mm. So I think that's what happens, and it's an easy place to begin to start because you're just going to see that that, you know, this, this meal or that glass of whatever, uh, that's basically an investment of this many calories in my plan. And then you can make choices off of that in terms of how you do that. So you're still in control. You still get to make decisions, but you need to be able to know what you're actually working with. That's helpful. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I will say that there's, um, it, we can make errors on this on both ends of the spectrum and yes. there are uh you know many that I, i'm that i make up that are listening that that is a challenge for them that they are uh really dealing with not bringing in enough calories yeah uh, it, you know and the, you know, so we can we can blow it on either end of the spectrum we can get too tight we can get too loose uh, it's always going to be about balance. Yeah. I mean, because when I think about the idea of, of, of leaders who are out of shape, I mean, especially in church world, I mean, we have an image of the fat pastor. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think that, that we also have an issue of what I would call uh, leaders who are skinny fat. 
Um, and so they're not actually in good shape. And when you, and when you pay attention to a couple of measurements, um, that I think are critical, you look and go, they're not in good shape. It's the dad bod. Okay. The guy isn't necessarily overweight. Um, but, uh, the, but you really do see that the way that you think of this is, yeah, you could fall off the horse, uh, more in, in more than just one way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it really is going to be about finding that balance and how do we do that and how do we do that in community? Because yeah. uh, most of us just are not going to get it done on our own. Uh, change rarely happens in isolation. Change yeah. happens best in community. I know from working with addicts for a number of years, one-on-one in my office with an addict, I'm good, but I, I still don't stand a whole lot of a chance. If yeah. I get a group of addicts together and we start doing work that way, that, that group is going to make incremental change faster. Yeah. Uh, they're going to move exponentially faster than the lone wolf is. It's just the Way it's going to be, uh, it, you know, and so where do you say strength fits in uh, overall into uh, the five factors? Well, I, I think again, the way we're approaching this is a different way of thinking about leadership. Is it's all integrated, and so if you show me somebody who's not physically healthy, I promise you that they are neither mentally, relationally, spiritually, or vocationally healthy either, mm-hmm. because uh, it's that important. And I would say the same for the others, you know, we're having, but we're having a conversation today about physical health and strength, mm-hmm. that, that that's the integration, that these all play out. And so maybe you're going to focus on physical health and strength because it's what I call a bleeding neck issue. You know, uh, <laughs> you, you fell off the ladder and you landed in the bushes and you twisted your ankle and you also have a branch sticking in your neck. When you go to the mm-hmm. emergency room, you don't want them to pay attention to the ankle first. Okay. The bleeding neck issue for some of us, we know it, like we can see it. We look at ourselves in the mirror and go, this isn't good. Uh, Mm -hmm. and go, and so maybe that's the reason why, but I promise you there are too many leaders walking around knowing that they're not in good shape, but really propping themselves up on the fact that they are spiritually healthy or relationally healthy or something else. And so they're all integrated. And so it fits in as one critical part of the entire whole of what it takes to lead in a healthy way. Yeah, which leads to our first marketing uh, giveaway. We are going to be selling uh, for, you know, for any, for any amount of gift, uh, the five factors tourniquet uh, to help you with any bleeding neck issues that you may come look, that you may stumble across um, or notice that you're just, you know, shooting blood uh, in your office. It's a $19.99 uh, that we're getting. It's a $199 value though. And we're going to upsell you into the, uh, the, uh, the ankle thing to help you with your sprained ankle. And it has miraculous healing powers as well. And available um, in three colors. <laughs> it's fantastic. Why not? Uh, you know, so uh, yeah, we'll be working on those five factor tourniquets for you uh, coming very, very soon. Uh, so, so Matt, this has been a helpful overview of strength uh, and how it relates into our physical health and how it relates into the overall five factors. What thoughts would you like to wrap up with today? Well, again, um, what I really want to walk away for anybody who's listened to this is just the simplicity of what we're talking about here. Uh, If you're going to be healthy as a leader, then you need to be physically strong. Um, Physically strong is self-defined. It's not you comparing to somebody else. And and it is the combination uh, of your eating, your sleeping, and your moving so that you get your hormones in balance. And that's going to impact every other aspect of your leadership. It's absolutely going to help uh, impact your mental health. It's going to impact your relational health. Um, it's going to impact your vocational and spiritual health as well. And, and so it's really, really critical in my mind for us to pay attention to this. And so one of the things that you could do, again, we're going to kind of end each of our episodes this way is for you just simply to do the next right thing. You don't have to do everything, just do the next right thing. And so for you, we'd encourage you to go into the show notes. There are going to be some links, to some several resources there that could be helpful some of my, like, here's my favorite book when it comes to eating and sleeping and moving. We'll have those in there, but we've created an overview of the entire five factors framework. Mm -hmm. So that as we're talking about this and, and we go into a little bit more detail as we talk about physical health as well. So I want to encourage you to go into the show notes. I want to encourage you to go ahead and download that framework, begin to familiarize yourself with what we're talking about as we continue to make our journey through on
on this podcast. And then you might as well go ahead and subscribe because what that's going to do is that every time we drop an episode, we're going to do this once a week, is that you're going to have a brand new episode that'll show up in whatever player that you use, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, all those, we're there. And it's just as easy as you showing up and hitting play. And then we'll be there to have these conversations with you and help you continue to grow as a leader. Love it. So uh, that is episode two, uh, folks. That's uh, now uh, done. So thanks for listening. And we look forward to you uh, being with us in the future with more of these podcasts, because I'm sure uh, since Matt has already asked you to do so, you have already subscribed. And uh, I'm just I'm just choosing to believe that waving my five factors tourniquet as I do so. And uh, so we look forward to having you with us on this journey. And uh, episode three will be along shortly. Thanks so much for listening. And this has been Tal Prince and Matt Adair for Five Factors.